Hey, David. Good morning. How you doing? Doing great. I hope you are this morning. Excellent. So we've got uh, on the hot seat, we've got David Couch. He is the Chief Executive Officer of Blue Ridge Companies and um, the mastermind behind Summerfield Farm, which we'll dive into uh, in a little while. And um, one of the things that fascinates me about David and why I really wanted to, to get him on the video chat to share his story is one word, vision. <laughs> and, you know, uh, my first book was called The Coach Approach. David is a former college athlete, scholarship athlete in football and baseball at Wake Forest University. And um, much like myself is a former coach, coached in Ashboro High School, correct, David? No, uh, Westchester Country Day School. In okay. High school. Yeah. Great. In Ashboro High School. And you grew up in Ashboro, right? In Ashboro, yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, I'd love to just kind of touch on uh, how, how you take the coach approach to your business, uh, whether it's coaching your people, leadership, uh, working with clients, all that. Uh, but first, I'd love to dive into a little bit about your fascinating backstory kind of your, your upbringing, because I think that that plants seeds for all of us uh, early in life that, uh, you know, kind of come to fruition later on in adulthood and in business. Sure. Hit me with your best shot. So uh, you grew up in Asheboro. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of uh, how you got into athletics and then, you know, how that led you, you know, outside of the confines of your community to Wake Forest and can you share that story a little bit? Well, sure. Yeah, my dad was, uh, was an athlete at Duke and during college. He played some football there in lacrosse. And so uh, I have two brothers, one older and one younger. And as we were growing up, we were always uh, shagging balls in the outfield. And he, he took a lot of time with us uh, playing uh, – Playing uh, youth football and baseball and basketball, we were just always busy. Back then, you didn't do this uh, single sport deal. It was, you know, you went from one season to the next to the next. And so uh, we grew up in a neighborhood with a lot of kids, and we had a field across the street called the Walker's Field, and that's where all the football happened. So it was so easy and so natural. And and uh, when I was growing up, you left early in the morning, and, uh, you know, if after about 30 minutes after dark, you weren't home, uh, the phone call chain started around the neighborhood and they found out where the posse was and everybody had to disperse and go home or bed down at the night, you know, the night at whatever house you were at. And, uh, so it was a great way to grow up. I love uh, Asheboro and Randolph County. It's just a very peaceful place. Um, and it's a, it's the quintessential village, you know, that it takes to raise any kid, I think, um, as a community. So, <laughs> Who's the most influential coach you had as a youth? Wow, that's, uh, it's hard to single out one. Um, my dad, obviously, early on, because he you know, got that taste of blood for competition and winning and, uh, and camaraderie among a team. So credit him first. Um, and I had some great youth coaches uh, along the way. Um, Mr. Mann was one there that coached me in Pony League. But as I got older and got into the higher levels of baseball, uh, it had to be uh, Martin Smith and uh, Daryl Rich from Asheboro and, um, and Charlie Robbins coached our Legion team for one year. He's deceased now and uh, God rest his soul. And uh, those three guys taught me, you know, a lot of baseball, uh, but also taught me more about life and how baseball really is a, the, the game of, I think it's the greatest game of life, actually. And, uh, I had one football coach that, uh, that never really coached me uh, on a team, but he taught me how to punt. And ultimately, that's what I ended up doing in college. And his name was Lee Stone. The stadium there in Asheboro is named after uh, yeah. it's Lee J. Stone Stadium. And so uh, he just took a liking to me and my passion for the game and for, for punting and spent some time with me to teach me how to do it right. And uh, that's kind of uh... – I think it's interesting you mentioned that, you know, it takes a village and I think, you know, you were able to draw from a lot of different experiences with different coaches, you know, uh, to get on my soapbox. I think that's absolutely the value of not specializing, especially not early on. Uh, it's just, 
you get a wide range of experiences, which helps you prepare for working for all kinds of different bosses, you know, when you, when you uh, enter the workforce. So I love that you touched on that. We're kindred spirits there. Well, that's, sure. that's absolutely right. It's a great point. Um, uh, not much of that's happening nowadays with the, you know, you got a kid that starts playing baseball at age five and parents got him in the big leagues, you know, from, from age five. And by the time he gets to college age, you know, if you look at the number of repetitions and hitting and the repetitions on that arm, and I'm not sure that's all a good thing, but uh, I wanted no. to go back one step that you, you asked about the connection to Wake Forest. There was a, a, a lawyer in Asheboro. His name was Ed Gavin and uh, his nickname was Honest Ed. And it was such a perfect nickname for him because he was just one of the great guys, super honest and did great work. Well, he wrote a letter that he, he copied to me. He wrote a letter to John Makovic, who was coaching the football team at Wake at the time, and he wrote a letter to Marvin Crater, who was coaching the baseball team. And I have to credit Ed with connecting me uh, to the coaches at Wake Forest. I was being recruited throughout the ACC, but it was through that personal connection with Ed and, uh, and Steve Walker across the street whose family owned the Walker's Field, and those guys connected me there, and that's what made that connection. Most people don't know John, the name John Makovic as being associated with Wake Forest. Yeah, he was there a short time, but did yep. some great work. And, uh, Absolutely. And I have to uh, include uh, Coach Makovic, too, in the, that group of influential coaches because I'd never really been exposed to the formal concept of goal setting. Mm -hmm. um, Coach Makovic, the season that I spent with Coach Makovic, and – I use that today, uh, short-term, mid-term, long-term goals, individual goals, and team goals. And so it was a master uh, of making sure that everyone on that team knew what their skill set was, knew how to deploy it, and knew how to set goals and push themselves. And so you know, kudos to him for, for that lesson. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I love that you still use that to this day. And I think that, you know, life is a team sport. And um, – I'm a lacrosse guy. I hadn't realized when we last spoke, I don't think it came up, that your father played lacrosse at Duke. I wasn't aware of that. But what's interesting is, you know, my background in sports as an athlete and as a coach is lacrosse. But what resonates the most with me as an adult and as an entrepreneur is the sport of baseball. And uh, I think it's a microcosm of life and that it's, it's a team sport, but in many respects, it's very much an individual sport. Uh, it almost mirrors entrepreneurship in that it's a game of failure and it's a game of opportunity. And, you know, I'd love to kind of transition a conversation, talk a little bit about, you know, it's uncommon for someone to be a Division I athlete in two sports, but sort of how you gravitated from, you know, not just football, but also baseball at Wake Forest and uh, how that's kind of been and became your first love. Yeah, well, it, it, became, uh, it, it became my first love, actually, before I got to Wake Forest. I, got a, uh, I was, I was um, scouted pretty heavily throughout Legion and high school baseball, but I got a call. I was down at Myrtle Beach for my little graduation celebration trip, and I got a call that I'd been drafted by the Oakland A's from my dad, and that, that really did, you know. Wow. I knew they were looking, but I didn't, you know, the, so that was a, not a surprise, but I mean, I guess it did uh, kind of open my eyes a little bit. And that's when yeah. baseball, I thought, well, I'm going to pursue this um, more so than, than football. But the interesting thing about football and baseball, I think football is a game of execution. If you think about it, the offense knows where they're going. The defense doesn't. So if everybody executes, all 11 players execute, then you should score on every play. Or you should at least get your three or four yards in a cloud of dust and go down first downs and score. So I, I, that is absolutely a game of execution. Baseball, and you touched on it, uh, I think is the game of life. Uh, I used to say it's a game of failure, but I've modified that a little bit. I think it's a game of failure management. Mm -hmm. And so it's also the best dichotomy of individual sport and team sport, depending, and it changes in a nanosecond. Yeah. When it's 0-2 in the bottom of the ninth and two outs and, and the defense is ahead, that's an individual sport for that pitcher to make one pitch. He's got to locate one pitch, get one strike, and get the third out, the one they're looking for. And 
at the same time, it's an individual sport for that hitter. Uh, if there's a man on second and, and the game's tied or they're one run down, um, at that point, make no mistake, it's an individual sport for that hitter. The moment the ball goes in play, it becomes a team sport for that pitcher, a team sport for that hitter. Uh, and every single approach that I ever had when I went to the plate, you, you take a team approach, you know, in your hitting, but individual execution. And so, and add to that the fact that baseball, you can call as many timeouts as you want um, w within reason. Yeah, no clock. And there's no clock. So it really, you can waste your time or you can leverage your time in baseball. And you can move the game, you can speed the game up sometimes, and you can slow the game down. And so from that standpoint, there's so much to learn. Yeah. I love your, uh, your analogy to entrepreneurialism because it uh, generally, the better everybody's feeling, the more positive they are, even in the eye of failure and, and doom and despair, whatever, typically everyone does better as a team and everyone does better individually. So that's kind of been my philosophy. I use sports analogies all the time, as, as many of the people that work with me will tell you. I'm sure it annoys some, but for some in the room who kind of get it, as you do, it all makes sense. And, but it's, a, it's kind of my way of communicating what we need to do. And one of my favorite phrases and, and crunch time is, you know, we got to huddle up, call a good play, and then we got to, you know, break that hole and go execute it. If we do that, Absolutely. we're going to be fine. And you were, you were huddling up by yourself and calling plays at a very early age. So I want to kind of take a step back in order to leap forward into your business career. You know, um, you were a little entrepreneur at an early age and managed to, uh, I think that, that vision that you have today in business uh, is something that got ingrained in you pretty early. You know, you're able to see opportunities and see things that other people uh, couldn't or simply didn't, and you executed on them. Can you talk to us a little bit about, um, you know, sort of what you did as a youth in an entrepreneurial way that kind of led you to you know, the Summerfield farm that we have today. Okay. Go I don't want to like prep the audience for any of this any more than I already have, because it's such an amazing story. I just want them to hear it from you. Well, thank you. You know, I think we all as kids, uh, or hopefully we all as kids got to, to do a stint at the lemonade stand. And so that was interesting to me. And, uh, you know, the concept of profit, uh, and engaging people. Um, but that quickly, uh, I always left to work. I started working uh, somewhat illegally, probably around the age of 12. Uh, worked on the tobacco farm and I worked at the golf course there at a country club in Asheboro. And so I, uh, I love the concept of working. And uh, so as I got to be about 14 or 15, baseball got really busy and a lot of summer baseball. And so I wanted to... Uh, Worked on that tobacco farm all day long and went and played baseball at night and games were over at 11 or 12. We were up again at five. And, but that's where the concept of little, little sleep and a lot of uh, heavy activity. My mom says uh, that she kept us out of her hair by, by that big muscle activity, keeping us yep. rolling all the time. Uh, but an interesting, uh, interesting kind of fact, I got intrigued with farming and cattle. And so about the time, just shortly after I was able to drive, I realized that the dairy farms would pretty much give you their bull calves if you just come by and get them, or maybe you had to pay 10 bucks for them. And yep. if they didn't have any, you could go to the sale at Siler City uh, on Friday and you could pick them up for 30 or 40 bucks and put them in the back of your pickup truck and take them home. So I'd feed the, I, I found, um, uh, Dan Lou Allen had lost her husband and her farm was kind of growing up and she and I, I had known one another a long time. And so I asked her if she would need some help out there and cleaning the place up and she said she would. And so I fixed her fences and wrapped the hot wire around it and fed these little bull calves up on a bottle. You know, they had a milk mix that you put in a bottle and I could do a group of uh, eight to 10 of them. And in six weeks I could have them kind of weaned and out there grazing and she enjoyed looking at them and, and I enjoyed doing the work. And um, so I, I learned that I could do two groups of those during the summer and one group during the winter. And so I learned the concept of staggering your cash flow and staggering your expenses. 
and staggering the workload, you know, during the summers when I had some extra time, uh, not extra time, but somehow fit it in with working sure. on a tobacco farm. And so I'd go out in the morning and feed them and I'd go out in the afternoon and feed them or sometimes late at night after a baseball game. But I always had a little bit of cash flow, you know, I always gave me a group of eight to 10 to sell and I'd reinvest and buy more. And so what, I really developed more of a love for farming and more of a love for cattle through that. What's fascinating to me about that is, um, you know, there are a lot of people who, um, you know, look at what they don't have rather than what they do have. And, you know, there are probably people think, oh, I'd love to be a farmer, but I don't have land. So I can't. As opposed to looking at what you do have, you have an opportunity to be a creative problem solver, solver, partner with someone for a win-win situation who does have land exactly. and maximize that. And, and, you know, I think that, you know, so many people get caught up or stuck in the weeds of, you know, focusing on what they don't have or what they wish they had, as opposed to thinking outside the box like that. Um, so how is that lesson that you learned at an early age served you well, you know, later in life or even today as we speak? Yeah, it's a great question. And, uh, you know, the, um, I'm a huge fan of Stephen Covey, um, Zig Ziglar, John Run, uh, Jim Rohn, uh, and, and Darren, uh, Darren Hardy. And uh, I've been so fortunate to, to be able to dive into a lot of their stuff, but the, uh, the seven habits is it, kind of, that changed my life. And um, so the concept of synergy uh, and um, win-win agreements, you know, so when I, I didn't realize it at the time, but when I went to Dan Lou Allen, uh, she and I went to the same church and I was, you know, was sad when she lost her husband and they took such pride in their place and I knew that it was going to be hard for her. And so I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but it was the perfect synergistic relationship where I came out from town every day. If she needed something, I'd bring it to her. When I cut my thumb on the farm she taught me to just pour salt in it really it, it yeah. really does work it stops the bleeding it hurts really bad for about 10 seconds then it's good but we fostered an unbelievable relationship uh, i got a benefit from it she got benefits from it and so i've tried to you know from that i try to approach everything of like what you don't have to equate everything equally what i, I learned that people value different things in different quantities and in different ways and so uh, if you, and you know this from being a skilled interviewer, you know, if you can become a, a skilled listener and a skilled interviewer, you can learn enough about any situation to really assess whether you bring anything of value to that person or whether through using a contact of yours, you might be able to pretty much for free derive value for them. And I've always derived a lot of personal value and being able to help someone or help myself and help them at the same time. So it's um, the synergistic benefits to all of that um, have always you know, intrigued me. And the other thing is that, you know, when you find that you don't have anything of value and there's no deal, so to speak, and you can't reach win-win, then you either keep working at it, you know, kind of win-win or no deal, or you simply agree to disagree agreeably and you move on and the next thing you know, uh, you never know what kind of relationship you might foster out of that. So. Sure. I think it, uh, if you look around our world today, we see a lot of examples of how this is being done and done really productively and really well. And unfortunately, you see a lot of examples too of how, you know, we could take a, a little more of that approach and, uh, and benefit more people throughout the world. So that's always been my philosophy is the first do no harm and second, see how you might synergize together and make, you know, make some cool stuff happen. Absolutely. And, you know, the whole concept of, you know, win-win and a rising tide raises all ships. You know, too many people look at, at their industry, their profession, maybe the market that they're in as a zero-sum game. There's one winner and everybody else loses, and it doesn't have to be that way. Um, that way. And, and right. just the ability to collaborate and to uh, grow something, you know, seemingly small to, you know, something that incorporates a lot of, like, a lot of different elements uh, and builds a sense of community, um, you know, that happens through synergy. It probably really can't happen any other way. Like none of us get there alone. We can't, we can't accomplish what we want to do by ourselves. And, you know, so can you fast forward to what you saw 
you know, based on that experience and then what you saw when you initially um, looked into acquiring Summerfield Farms or what was uh, the property that is some, that, that is yeah. Summerfield Farms? Because it's almost like, you know, that early lesson has repeated itself on a larger scale later. Yeah. Well, it's a, I'll try to keep it brief, but um, if I've ever been depressed in my life, it was shortly after graduation from college. I uh, felt like I'd been successful and played two sports and double majored and worked really hard. But I missed all the interviewing that happens, you know, in your last semester. And so yeah. I walked into the placement office to try to get some help to get a job two weeks after graduation. And uh, they said, well, you're a little early, aren't you? And I said, ma'am, you don't understand. I graduated you know, two weeks ago and, and the economy wasn't great. Then they said, boy, it, this is going to be tough. And, and were they right for the next six months? I sent letters to any and everyone from uh, you know, any company I could think of that needed a Spanish speaking econ major. Um, and I, uh, my parents gave me a pair of boots for graduation and they had a great big boot box. And so I filled that boot box up with all the rejection letters uh, from all these companies. It was like they all wrote the same paragraph and just, yeah, and you couldn't copy and paste, but it seemed like it was copied and pasted. So, um, so eventually, um, got into the I got an opportunity to straight commission work in commercial real estate uh, with Dick Maxwell in Greensboro. And so, uh, I almost hate to admit this, but when I got there, uh, I first had to start studying for my license, but I hung out all day to see if I could learn anything. And I was so green that I didn't know what a listing was. And I was too shy and introverted at that point. I was extroverted as an athlete, introverted, you know, in this world. And uh, I didn't really have the confidence to ask what it was. So I thought to myself, if you just shut up and, and hang around long enough, you might figure it out. So that took two weeks to actually figure out what a listing was. And so, so I did not start off fast in the business and I, and I wasn't great at selling and brokering, but what I was intrigued with, I knew how to talk to farmers and I love farmland. And so I'd sneak around out here in Northern Guilford County and, uh, and I actually uh, have to admit that I snuck onto J.C. Cowan's property one day, right up just like four feet across the property line and I saw the pastures and this old Hereford herd and I said, that's what I want to do. And one of these days, this is the most beautiful farm I've ever seen. I'd like to own it. And uh, that was the first year of my career. And so I continued talking to farmers and, you know, as one member of their family would die off or heaven forbid they would die off, their family always wanted to, you know, monetize the farm or do something with it. And so I learned to follow sewer lines and follow road trends and talk to planning departments and eventually learned how to put water lines in and sewer lines in and build roads and subdivide property. Um, and, but it kind of started with that farming and with, with uh, knowing that in Guilford County, a, a lot of the land, it's the most beautiful land, was on the edge of growth and it was going to get developed. And if it was going to get developed, uh, I had both an interest in maintaining the farming while taking the utmost care to see that it developed in a, in a reasonable manner and, and with the best practices kind of mindset. Sure. And so the planning departments here in Guilford County of High Point Greensboro and Guilford County taught me a lot. And, We've spread now to probably 50 different communities throughout the Southeast and developed in those and always taken a kind of a holistic approach to, to that development. And um, so it, it's the, the whole farming uh, of land and production and what it can do and how to be a good steward of it, it's always meant a lot to me. So Summerfield started off as, um, I hate to use the expression, but you know, air quotes, just a farm. And you know, it's turned into really a destination. So could, could you speak a little bit to just kind of the steps you took, you know, to go from quote, just a farm to, you know, just kind of adding another level of service and, and really kind of creating a destination, you know, that's incredibly multifaceted. Because, you know, I know you're a Stephen Covey fan and this really sounds like begin with the end in mind. And again, speaks to that vision of yours. Well, you, you may be giving me, uh, you, I know that you're giving me way too much credit because in all honesty, when I first saw J.C. Cowan's farm, uh, no farm that I've ever looked at 
is, uh, is just a farm. Every farm, just like every person, has that special purpose, that special gift, and uh, that special ability to produce uh, and be part of the community. So when, but when I saw it, it just was a staggering, one of the most beautiful pieces of raw land. And I had no vision whatsoever of it being Summerfield Farms one day. So fast forward probably 15 years from the first day I saw it. Mr. Cowan, uh, when I first saw it, was alive and well, and his family was, uh, was producing cattle there. And it had been some years since I'd ridden by the farm. I rode by one day and this big sign, this big for sale sign was on it. And I was shocked. And But what dawned on me was that Mr. Callan must have passed away because no one in their right mind would ever sell that piece of property. And of course, he had unfortunately had passed away. Uh, and the property had been on the market for the better part of a year without me knowing about it. And there, there wasn't the internet there and then the information wasn't available. And you just had to be lucky enough to ride by something or, sure. or hear about it. And so uh, I was able to put together a pretty creative uh, takedown of the property from, uh, from his estate and uh, immediately started uh, with the idea that I would just hay farm it, you know, just grow, grow hay. And so my daughter was getting into, the, uh, into horseback riding on a very, very competitive basis. And I noticed what what that group was paying for square bales was a whole lot more than I was used to buying them for in Asheville. So we started making uh, high-end alfalfa hay and orchard grass hay. And uh, that started with a little Massey Ferguson tractor and a six foot bush hog. And I mowed the whole 300 acres and, wow. you know, and it was grown up in saplings. And I drove that bush hog over some trees that you just wouldn't believe they were sitting in the middle of these pastures and got the grass growing and, started harvesting and we shipped hay all over North Carolina and South Carolina. And um, all the barns were broken down and had briars and honeysuckles and more morning glory growing all over them. So we stripped all that out and kind of recovered the look. The, the old farmhouse had oil and water underneath it and dead animals. I'll never forget the first time I walked down into the cellar, I found myself crotch deep in uh, black water and dead animals and uh, that had gotten in there. So wow. Yeah, so we we picked the house up on rails and moved it and cleaned out the uh, the foundation and disposed of the soil and remediated all that and and uh, we built another foundation. That was the first renovation project. That was the farmhouse. And, uh, today, that farmhouse has has served many families well and it's served us well as an office. But we're in the process of converting it to a farm to table restaurant and. Um, and kind of a cocktail lounge out there for the community. And uh, we're in a little bit of a, a food desert here. Sure. You know, where we've got pizza all around our perimeter, but no real place to go, uh, you know, get uh, get a consistent uh, farm meal. And so we're working on that. Um, what else is on the property now? You got well, we have a, uh, it's going to be a restaurant. What else? Yeah, we have a, an events uh, business that, uh, that we've built out of the old hay barn, which, uh, which was the old animal barn and it just had some stalls in it. So I put rails under it and lifted it up um, to get plenty of hay storage. We would pack about 40,000 square bales of, of hay in it every year. And then we raised turkeys and chickens and little baby calves in it. Uh, so four or five years ago, that's what that barn was. And today, wow. if you walk inside, you can look on our website and you can see what we've, uh, we've converted and renovated it into. So we have an events business. We have a, an organic, um, the, all 600 and some acres of it is certified organic. And so um, we have a grass-fed beef, grass-fed, grass-finished uh, beef business. We have an organic garden. We have the events business. And then um, we have several structures on the property, so cabins and homes and that kind of thing. And, and we lease those out as well. So we're, uh, and we have a, an on-farm market that, uh, that we have our ABC licenses, so you can come in and get your craft beer, you can get your kombucha, you can get all your organic uh, food. Uh, nice. We carry, it's all about health and wellness and trying to find the very best products in each category and, mm -hmm. and utilizing our customer base to help us find even better products. And if you can find it and it's better than the one we have, we'll replace it with what you found and we'll source it for you. So it's, uh, it's been awesome. an interesting, uh, yeah. interesting 
kind of project to work on in a holistic way towards uh, nutrient dense food and health and wellness. And that's uh, so I'm going to put a link in the uh, show notes to Summerfield Farm and uh, the other things you have going on, uh, your other businesses. And so, so people know Summerfield Farms is just a small part of everything you have going on. Uh, I'm actually, I'm, I'm convinced that you somehow found a way um, to clone yourself. There's got to be like three or four David couches given just the kind of the scope of all that you do. Um, you know, you spent time uh, earlier as a coach as you sort of uh, were, I imagine, growing your business and expanding into different areas. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit about the commercial real estate business that you have uh, because I think it's really unique. And sort of as we shift gears to that, um, could you speak, you know, for a minute or two here to just sort of how, uh, how did being a coach, you're a high school baseball coach, right? How did that prepare you for leading a company? Because I think uh, success that, leaves clues and there are lots of transferable parallels uh, in life as we talked about earlier. So how about that coaching component? How did that prepare you for leading a company? It actually happened in, in reverse. I became a coach uh, a little after uh, okay. we founded the, the Blue Ridge companies and um, my partner Chris Dunbar and I um, founded the company. I founded the construction part of the company before uh, he joined, but uh, we kind of founded and grew the Blue Ridge companies and Blue Ridge property management together. And so it was through that that, that we incorporated a lot of uh, coaching components into uh, growing the company. And thank goodness uh, we, we found some amazing teammates along the way that actually had forgotten more about the multifamily business than we would ever know. And I have to admit that through watching people like Susan Passmore uh, grow that part of the company, it, it's what helped me learn what a great coach is all about and, and how to build an organization. Um, because I'd always been a player. You know, I knew, sure. I knew great coaching, but only when I was experiencing it, but that didn't really qualify me to know how to dissect what it was that made a great coach. But it was through watching those people uh, and Chris Dunbar is a great coach as well and a great, a great motivator and a great mentor. And so when it came time um, and being very involved in, in my kids' school, um, they had a, a, a very well graded baseball field, but it wasn't very well finished at all. And uh, as I started hanging around the baseball program and my son was getting a little older, my daughter had a boyfriend that was playing on the, the middle school team in eighth grade. And I thought, well, what a devious way to get to know him better. And, uh, <laughs> and there's, Counterintelligence. Yeah, there's something that I can contribute there. Uh, and I was asked actually by one of her teachers who was coaching the middle school if I would help. And so, um, so I just read Joe Ehrman's book, A Season of Life. And if you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. And um, I found it on the pillow of my bed at a hunting camp from a dear friend of mine. So I couldn't put it down. I read it. So I, I gave that teacher the book and I said, you read this book. And if you're about coaching in that manner, you know, I don't have the time to do it, but I'll make the time to help you out. So I figured I'd hear from him in a couple of weeks. Well, that was on a Friday at the basketball game on Saturday night. He came up to me and he put his finger in my face and he said, you're in. Uh, I read that book. It's amazing. And that's exactly the way I'd love, you know, to try to, to coach this team. And so fast forward, I coached with him for a season and then the, um, then the varsity coach vacated the position. I knew they were going to just go hire somebody to throw the balls out and, and kind of keep everybody safe. And so I went to the administration and said, you know, I'm willing to dedicate the time to build a baseball program here. If I can get some support from you uh, and allow us to do what we need to do. And here's the book, read the book. If you're interested, you know, uh, I'm in. And so they read the book and said, you know, we're in. So we built the a dynasty program that I'm proud to say one of our former players who's now the coach at Westchester Country Day School just won the conference championship last night and was voted coach of the year so it's a super proud uh, day for me to yeah be a kid that so, was so amazing and a great leader of our team now become the leader of the program and carry that legacy forward and, so. and that's uh, the power of a book 
uh, the power of a leader putting the book into action and what a wonderful legacy piece that is for you to see that happen last night. That, that's uh, amazing. Congratulations. Uh, thanks. It, it was a proud moment. And, uh, so Devin McLemore, if you watch this video, I'm calling you out, man. I'm so proud of you and, and Mickey Willard. We've had two players actually coach that team. Mickey's gone on to coaching college now and, and uh, Devin's building the program and just amazing things. It's just so pleasing to see these tremendous young men that you coach to come along and see the value of what you're doing to carry it forward. So. I think every great team uh, starts with one thing, David, whether it's a corporate team or uh, an athletic team, and it starts with an amazing culture. Uh, the culture, you know, I've gotten to, to learn uh, quite a bit about the culture that you built at Blue Ridge. And, you know, I, I think if a leader doesn't get the culture right first, it doesn't matter what else they try and do. It's not going to be set set up for success. The culture is really what primes the pump. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know this whole concept of uh, uh, your your positive impact program and what you've done to build that culture? Because it starts at the top. Uh, for better or for worse, everything always starts at the top with a leader, and uh, you know. As I've said before, I mean, keep saying it. I love your vision, and I think that your you know your company's core values are a wonderful reflection of that. And I just love for you to share with everyone sort of how that came to be, and you know how you've painted your people and your teammates into the picture there. Well, I'd, uh, thank you for recognizing that, and it's something that we're we're very proud of, and. Uh, um, I wish I could say it was it was by strategy and intent, you know, that we began with culture. But what we realized was that you know there's a culture whether you set it or not. Yeah. And uh, if if you're a positive person and you understand positive culture, um, my mom told me this. You know, she used to work at uh, at Duke University. She was in their development department, and she wasn't really in a management position. But she said, you know, this management thing. Uh, it seems to me it's pretty easy. If you can just keep people doing more of what they like to do and less of what they hate to do, yeah. you get pretty easy. And so I've always looked at that to say, you know, sometimes we have to do things that we don't like to do. And if we can gain, get some help and minimize that, maximize the things that we love to do, and do more of that. So, so credit to her for that kind of thinking. But the culture gets back to the character and integrity of every individual. And uh, we do as much testing as we can to try to test that out up front. We love word of mouth um, um, referrals sure. from people that we trust. And um, but but I have to credit uh, Susan Passmore and and, uh, and the other members of our team and uh, and Dusty Staub. If you could look up Staub Leadership, um, you know, on the web, Dusty's an amazing uh, life coach for me and a mentor. And I saw Dusty and. Late 2007, this was before the recession really, uh, well, the recession had already hit. I was just too dumb to recognize that it had hit me in the head. I had a big knot. I just didn't feel it. But uh, so when I met Dusty, uh, we went through what's called a life plan. And mm -hmm. the whole life plan relates to where do you derive your joy and where do you derive your pain? And it had never dawned on me that if you really develop an awareness of joy and pain, where you derive each from, why wouldn't you design your life, your teams, your company, your family to derive more joy, less pain sure. and pursue that? And so it was a eureka moment for me. I introduced him to our company and then just kind of got out of the way. And it was amazing what happened when we developed our mission statements, our vision statements, our short-term, mid-term, long-term, and what we stand for. And so we had, we had been through um, the normal hiring and firing that you do when you form a company. And uh, we had what I call, you know, our foxhole people. Um, yep. You go through a little bit of that, you know, you've got people that didn't necessarily work out for one reason or another, or they did work out and they you know, had, a, had to move because of a spousal transfer or whatever. But once you get your foxhole people, whether you've had anything to do with it or not, you begin to develop a culture. And so what I realized was, man, I want the culture of this company to be a melting pot of all of these amazing foxhole people that have come to the table. I don't want it to be my way. I want it to be our way. 
And so we cherry picked the best that everybody had through a series of whiteboarding and brainstorming. And we came up with what you see on our website. Um, and I learned this from Stephen Covey that you know, where you don't get input, you'll never get buy-in. And so yep. we went through exhaustive uh, input sessions to where everybody got to put their ideas in and we batted them about and we debated and argued and, and what you see is what we came up with and I've never been prouder of a group of people. I've never felt safer in my life than I do to have the foxhole people that I have around me in my life. And the culture that you see there honestly is, is not my culture, but it's a culture of one that got formulated when the foxhole people all came together and I did get a few licks in and a few thoughts and ideas, but sure. it's a, it's a very collaborative um, intent. It's a collaborative strategy and collaborative focus on what we wanted to be. And we wanted to make sure that it was timeless and it really doesn't have as much to do. It doesn't have really anything to do with net operating income profits. It, 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 that is a byproduct of the culture that we have and the way we go about doing business. And if you can't structure things to where you succeed as everyone else around you succeeds and you serve your customer well, um, then, you know, shame on you. But we, we think that we are successful today because of what it feels like to be a member of one of our communities. We don't view it, we don't, we never viewed it as an apartment project, an apartment complex, a development or anything else. We view it as a vertical neighborhood in a community. And for the people that live there, that's absolutely what it is. And our job is to make sure that they know what it feels like to be one of our community members and one of our residents and to be part of our neighborhood. And so that's mm -hmm. important to us. What I love about that is so often, uh, you know, the terminology, if you look at the terminology, it's a quote, real estate transaction. Yeah. And there's actually very little that's transactional about what you're describing. It's transformational, it's relational, and you're absolutely right. You know, uh, your culture uh, is either, it's happening whether you realize it or not. Is it by default or is it by design? And by design always wins. You know, kind of take it back to baseball. What I found fascinating about what you, what you just said was, you know, we're not looking at profit and loss statements. We're not looking at the, the quote, numbers. You know, we're looking at the culture and the process. And I, I look at that kind of like a baseball player. You know, what happens if you're constantly um, worried about stressing over and looking at your batting average, you know, or how you did that night or your last at bat, you know, the, those numbers kind of lead you to a bad place and you get in your own head, don't you? You sure do. And uh, you can mistake uh, the, the individual portion of that game for the team portion. Uh, and uh, one of the interesting things that, that you know, being a baseball fan, is that uh, baseball is much like the stock market and that there's a statistic for everything. And some of the greatest statistics have to, in baseball have to do with effectiveness. They're great home run hitters and they're great pitchers with low ERAs and great number of strikeouts. But the players that I like to have on my team are the ones that not only can move a runner when a runner needs to be moved, but ones that know when it's time to move a runner and when it's time to swing for the fences. And uh, that comes with a situational awareness and, uh, and a focus on team. What does the team need right now? We don't really need a home run when there's um, – less than two outs and a guy on third and we're down one run, we really need a 14 hopper to the second baseman that scores that run and we'll give up an out. You know, we play better when the game's tied than we do when we're behind. Sure. We, you know, get the ball on the ground and stop trying to be a hero, um, which is usually when you, you make your outs. And yeah. so, uh, there goes one of those sports analogies. Again. Yep. And, uh, well, it it kind of reminds me of the baseball player Kevin Millar. You know, when he's in the minor leagues, kind of the, the quote scouting report on him was he doesn't do anything really well. He just beats you every time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so like the numbers can be deceiving and it's like, what's, you know, what's the outcome and how's that happening? You Absolutely. Know? I'll draw your attention. Uh, playing the role that you're supposed to, when you're supposed to play it and, yeah. and being a part of the big picture. Absolutely. So I love that. A dear uh, friend of mine uh, plays for the Royals now, Whit Merrifield, uh, who you may know is a second baseman, plays some center field. He's yeah. that same kid, you know. He yeah. he's just going to beat you every time. And when the game's on the line, he he won the got the winning hit the national championship at USC uh, University of South Carolina years ago. But 
just does everything the real right. USC. I'm not going to get into that argument. <laughs> but there's two. Right? Well, I'm not a, Car- a Carolina fan, but I know the real Carolina is the University of North Carolina. Yeah. So there you go. Today, but no, so, he's that quintessential kid that does yeah. focuses on how how can I stay in my tree, on my limb, do my thing, and do the one thing that's in my control right now that helps this team and that might be draw a walk it might be get the bunt down it might be hit the 14 hopper the second baseman and let me score this run or it might be drive one deep you know the left field and so I just admire his approach it's always how can I do the thing my team needs me to do most right now and that's, you know, it's business right there, too. That's baseball is a metaphor for life. Absolutely. Or, you know, business or family, for that matter, uh, which I believe, you know, you know, this kind of takes the interview full circle. Like, that's what we started off with. It's, a, it's sports is a metaphor for life. Yeah. And um, so I, I'd love to, to get your uh, take and just sort of like if you could give one piece of advice, you know, to an entrepreneur or a leader, uh, based on what you know now that you wish you knew back when you got started, what would that be? Wow. Uh, so can I put it in two categories? Absolutely. Okay. One, um, if you don't have a life coach, uh, look up Dusty Staub, S-T-A-U-B. He was actually related to Rusty Staub. Excellent. Who just passed away, unfortunately. And uh, So look up Dusty Staub or find yourself a life coach you can call that a mentor, but be very, very, very scrutinizing and selective with who you allow in your head space yep. and who you want to be programming your hard drive. Be very selective. Um, I got lucky. Uh, I read his articles in the local business journal and for two years put off calling him. I finally realized yep. he's right here in my market by looking at the area code, called him up, and it changed my world. The second thing that I would say is to be very assertive, aggressive, greedy, if you want to be, over reading everything that you possibly can on personal growth. Yeah. Um, if it's negotiation, Roger Dawson's amazing. Read his books. If it's um, positive thinking, uh, Zig Ziglar and all those guys are amazing. Uh, Jim Rohn, if it's motivation and um, – and Darren Hardy, but, but read it everywhere. It doesn't mean you have to buy it, but you, you can be an unbelievable filter, but be reading something that helps you get better all the time. And uh, as you read it, highlight it, make notes, and pay it forward, share it. Um, I've given away more books, and a lot of them that have my scribble scrabble in it and my notes. Um, yep. But I just think it's good karma. I believe in karma. Um, and I believe you know, paying things forward, backwards sideways up and down any way you can i think it's uh it does the world good does our universe good anything that does mankind good and uh, creates good uh, it's all good and uh, so those two things i think are important and uh and the other the, i guess a third thing would be design a system that allows you to feel so good about what you do when you lay your head down at night and then align your financial success as a byproduct of doing things the right way and doing things that make you feel good, doing things you're passionate about. Um, and all work becomes play at that point. Um, that, that came from my great grandfather. When you find something you're passionate about, design a system around it, you never work another day in your life. You know, I have yeah, I think a lot of people can, you know, a lot of people know what they're passionate about, but they don't necessarily, uh, build a system around it. And that's really what you said is the missing link. And you've got to be able to systemize that. You know, uh, I think if, if you can't describe what you're doing as a process or a system, ultimately you really don't know what you're doing because you can't duplicate that. Exactly. You can't effectively teach it to other people if you, don't, you haven't systematized that. So yeah. that's priceless advice. Two great examples. Uh, Johnny Morris, the owner of Bass Pro Shop, was passionate about carving bass lures and, and started doing it in his dad's garage. Uh, and so go read that story. Yeah. Uh, Richard Childress was, was passionate about hauling cars to the track uh, with Dale Earnhardt 
that used to sleep under meat mayonnaise sandwiches, <laughs> you know, to have enough fuel to race. Go read that story, uh, Richard Childress Racing. And uh, they're, they're two, um, two heroes of mine that have just built empires from their passion. Yep. It all starts with a passion and then, you know, builds from there. Great stories. Excellent. Uh, David, last question for you is uh, what's a mistake you made? You know, kind of if you could have a mulligan or uh, a, a do-over in your professional <laughs> career, what, what's one thing that you um, kind of, you know, playing Monday morning armchair quarterback looking back, boy, I really wish I would have done uh, this a little different if I could replay that and just well, kind of learn from it. I'll answer it in, in two different ways. The, the thing that haunts me a little bit uh, that I'm working on, it's hard to say it's a regret because it's worked out pretty well for me financially compared to probably what it would have been. But I always wondered had I signed at age 17 with the A's, yeah. if I'd have gone up and played one baseball game in minor league ball and they say, man, you're really terrible, but here's a jersey that, you know, at least then you know. Yeah. And, uh, and I, so I've always wondered how I would have done in a, in a serious system of development. So if I have a, a regret, it's that. But when I look at the grand scheme of things, God really does know what he's doing. He probably kept me out of the game for a reason. Uh, um, but, you know, mistakes, I won't really call this a mistake, although I've made a million of them, and I've benefited more from my mistakes and that sequential learning uh, than a lot of my successes. I would have met that life coach 20 years earlier. Sure. I would have. Uh, I did start listening to Zig Ziglar. Uh, I, I was so insecure and so introverted that I went to my first Zig Ziglar seminar because I was. I didn't want to go to another listing presentation and lose. I didn't want to make another cold call. Yep. And it seemed like it was less than a hundred bucks to go watch him at the Coliseum. And so I said, Well, maybe I need to go listen to this and hopefully. Uh, I'll learn something. When I walked in, the first thing Zig Ziglar said, he says, take a piece of paper, write these three letters at the top, A-H-A. -A. That spells aha. If you end up with three things on that page today, I'll consider my job done. Well, in the first three minutes, I had 10 things under the aha component, and I learned it changed my whole career. And so uh, hard to say that I would have done that any earlier because that was in the first year of my career. But, but I'd say pack in your – your knowledge tools and pack in your common sense tools, pack in your relationship skills early as early as possible in life and seek that information and that knowledge with such a insatiable starving hunger um, yep. and, uh, and pay the, pay the good learning forward. Absolutely. I, I would say, uh, you know, Jim Rohn probably said, uh, something very similar, work on your business, you'll make a living, uh, work on yourself and you'll make a fortune. Yeah. And it all starts with that, you know, personal development and Absolutely. being a reader, being a lifelong learner and studying others. So awesome, David. Thank you. So one last tie into the athletic, think about any athlete, especially at the, you know, at the elite levels that they'd love quantum leaps and improvement. Mm-hmm but they get quantum leaps by working on fractions. The golfers, they work on percentage points, tenths of a point of stroke reduction in a year. And the baseball players, you know, they work on a slight more backspin or whatever it is. And so, um, you know, I love the concept of uh, aim small, miss small. Sure. And uh, you know what I mean? Any golfer, you know, aims at a small Absolutely. spot on the ball. Any baseball player aims at a small spot on the ball. So if you miss, you miss small, you still get a pretty good solid contact. But that's a great moniker, I think, for life is, uh, is have a very, very tight focus on what you're doing. And if you miss small, great things still happen. So. Exactly. Excellent. Thanks, David. Thank you. And uh, I'll make sure I put a uh, – a link to your website, Summerfield Farms, and um, specifically uh, the Positive Impact Culture page on the Blue Ridge website for everybody. And uh, I can't thank you enough.